main reason why we wanted to do this was that we were finding a lot of people were not equipped with the information and the, the skills that they needed to potentially respond. And we know how difficult it can be in a situation where you're not quite sure whether or not someone may be experiencing an overdose or not, and you don't really know what to do, kind of like what you were saying. You felt kind of helpless in that moment. And so when we looked at this, we wanted to try to give it like a, a digestible way for individuals to understand um, what goes into overdose prevention and, and naloxone administration. Uh, and so we went to a training, Sarah and I, an all-day training that all, all talked about overdose prevention in Narcan. Tell you, it was long. Um, it was very heavy, the topic, but we have a lot of good information that we brought from that um, that we're gonna bring to you guys today. So what we're gonna go over first is understanding opioids, especially with heroin and fentanyl. You'll definitely see fentanyl a lot more now on the news um, and kind of the potency and kind of how it's fueling a lot of the opioid epidemic continuously right now. Um, so we'll get into what it is and kind of how it impacts uh, the opioid epidemic, but we, w we wanted to make a clear distinction. Um, overdose, we talk about statistics, especially here in Somerville. Um, we have some maps and graphs and things that will kind of show you the layout and the distribution of overdoses over the last year or so. Uh, we talk about risk factors, we talk about signs and symptoms, Narcan and the Good Samaritan Law. Especially the Good Samaritan Law where a lot of people are hesitant to respond because they're not quite sure how they may be liable after intervening. Um, sneak peek, you are not as long as you do everything that we tell you to do. Um, and we like to kind of just un let people know what that is and kind of how they, it can be used to facilitate interventions. Um, this is where Sarah typically comes in. She'll talk about kind of how to administer Narcan and um, what that looks like. Hello, are you here for the training? All right, come on in. If you want to sign up down there. Oh. Grab, grab stuff. We're right at the beginning, so good timing. Um, and so we'll go over that. There's four different ways in which that you could administer Narcan. There's four different types. Um, not types in terms of the Narcan itself, but um, the methods that you could do it, yeah. And I'll be using naloxone and Narcan interchangeably. It's the brand and the generic name. So um, naloxone is the generic name. The brand name is Narcan. So you'll hear it more commonly referred to as Narcan. And then resources. So we talk about supporting employees and then any additional trainings that may be coming up um, or anything that you could access uh, outside of us. So um, opioids. Typically, I'm not going to say because usually it comes one by one, but we have it all going at once right now. But what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of opioids? Just shout out anything. Heroin. Heroin. Yep. Uh, pain. pain relief. Yep. Overdosing. Overdose. Okay. Great. Yep. Yep. So I am so glad that you were the first one to speak um, because I think nine times out of ten at this point in trainings that we've done, the first thing that somebody has said is heroin. And we use that as a launching point to talk about how it's more than just heroin these days. You know, we talk about Percocets and um, Oxycontin and, and the synthetic opioid companies really fueling a lot of it. So um, there's the traditional version. Um, and this is giving you a lot more information. Usually these come in individually, but I'll go through. Um, there's the type that comes from the opium poppy, so that's the heroin, the naturally deriv derived version, and then there's the version that's synthetically made by drug companies. So you'll see a lot of these drug companies right now in court uh, for their role in uh, is starting the opioid epidemic, um, but there is a distinction between the two. Um, opioids can be illegal, so they can be heroin. You're not going to get prescribed heroin anymore. Way back in the day, I found an old picture of like a prescribed heroin from a doctor. Uh, you will not get prescribed heroin because there's no real um, medicinal quality to it. Um, and then painkillers by prescription. So these are the ones that you're getting when you go to the doctor and you may have a soldier pain or surgery, recovering from a surgery. Um, you know, much like myself, back when I got my wisdom teeth taken out, I came out of there with a 30-day supply of Percocets and, with a refill. Um, it's gotten much better. I just had surgery two weeks ago, and it was only 10 with no refill. So they've gotten better. So think of that as like a, I think I was 17, 18 years old, coming out with all that stuff. I really didn't need it. I didn't use it, thankfully. I just used the ibuprofen 800 milligrams. That sufficed. Probably because my parents were like, yeah, you're not going to be touching any of these. Um, but I can only imagine how slippery that slope is for someone that may not have anybody looking out for them or if they don't really know kind of what they're getting into because they think, well, it's coming from my doctor. How bad could it be? And I think that's a lot of the sentiment that people, at least early on, have been feeling. Um, but... Though they're typically prescribed for pain management or addiction treatment. Um, addiction treatment more the suboxone, um, where you know it's combining buprenorphine and naloxone for individuals who are trying to wean off uh, recovery or, or who are in recovery. Um, but 
Opioids, they depress the central nervous system, so they attach to specific proteins on the brain, uh, spinal cord and gut. And then what happens is when the drugs are attaching to the brain or the spinal cord or gut, it becomes overwhelmed to the point where it stops sending signals to the brain, which includes breathing. So as it gets overwhelmed, it starts to shut down and you're, you're losing the ability for your body to communicate with, with, within the system. Uh, and we have a video, I hope this is set up to, do you have Wi-Fi on this? Perfect. Uh, usually we forget to do that and we have to do it midway, so this is perfect. You guys have a great setup here. Uh, we'll show a video that kind of flushes that out more for you guys. <laughs> All right. I'll okay, so we should be fine. Um, so individuals who have used opioids, we've talked with many individuals who are living in recovery now, and you know, they typically report opioids cause the euphoria, the warm, drowsy feeling, typically to detach from reality, from pain, stresses, desires, anxiety. Um, you know, things are tough and people are trying to find an outlet to cope. And as we've seen in many mis misguided advertising techniques, that they are not wonder drugs, they are not gonna be the cure-all for everything, as despite, you know, the little cloud that, what is it, the, the woman who's depressed and she has the dark cloud falling around her? You know, that one drug is not going to be the end-all cure-all for that person. Um, but it, it, it's something as people have been using as a coping skill and then kind of, if they're prone to addiction, it may be genetically or just, the, you know, the way that the drug act on their body, uh, they may be more susceptible to addiction. So. Um, these are all the types of opioids, or not all, but a good, good list of, of them. So we have heroin, Oxycontin, Percocet, Vicodin, Buprenorphine, Methadone, Fentanyl, Morphine, and Codeine. Um, so you'll see these in many different varieties, liquid form, pill form. Um, but we like to highlight it because, as I was mentioning, heroin is one of the opioids that we're seeing, but it's not just the only one that, that's out there. Uh, and we like to particularly star in on fentanyl. Um, because of, whoop, whoop, there we go, um, because of its potency. So you can see here, this shows uh, how long the drug is in your system, not high, how long the high is experienced. The high is usually in the beginning portion, then it kind of tapers off as it's in your body. Um, but this is how long any of these could be in your, your, your um, body at one time. So methadone, you can see, typically that's like pain when you're in the hospital, you have the, meth, uh, the drip, is that what it's called? Um, the drip where you can sit there and hit it. Um, and you can see it acts on your body for a long time. There we go. Oh, I can't do it because it's not. But um, it's a pointer. Yeah, but it won't show on the screen. <laughs> Anyways, I can point to it. So you have the methadone, and then you can see the potency here. You have heroin, you know, all the various ones. But the one we particularly like to highlight is fentanyl because it sees, you could see that it acts on your body in a short period of time, so two to four hours. And then the potency is off the charts. So this actually should be over here. It's not as close as this, but the strength of fentanyl compared to heroin um, or any other of the opioids is, is unbelievably, unbelievable, off the charts. So we like to show this graphic here uh, to talk about kind of what the difference is between heroin and fentanyl. So fentanyl is synthetically made. It's made by synthetic drug companies. Um, it's formulated to be about 100 to 120 strong, times stronger than morphine. Um, where heroin's 15 times stronger than morphine, you can imagine that the difference between the two is very big. And there's a newer version coming out uh, that people are hearing a little bit about carfentanil. It's almost, I think, 100, or it's like... It's ca than, than fentanyl. Um, and, and it's really, really potent. So um, the interesting thing about fentanyl is that there is some limited medical use to it. So there is... Um, typically, it's been prescribed to individuals who are dealing with cancer pain, um, with high cancer pain. Um, and they were formulated in patches. So you would get them when you were in the hospital and you'd put them on your arm or typically your arm, right? Or like on your shoulder. Or shoulder. Like that. And it would, it would have an instant effect. It would really impact um, your pain management at that time. And what people would do to divert some of it is they'd cut it in, up into a little, because it's a patch, and you could cut it up and break it up and divert it to other people and use it for other reasons. Um, and so what happened was... In the south, I think it was Alabama, there were these two doctors who realized that they could take this fentanyl in the, um, the patches and make it into a nasal spray form. And what they did was they created a nasal spray similar to what you're going to get with the Narcan today and made it very easy for individuals to just pretty much spray it right into their nose and still have the same effect that they would if they had the patches on them. And what they found out was that it was very highly addictive and individuals were not really understanding the uh, initial concerns about it. I think they downplayed it 
and they didn't let people know all of the addictive qualities to it. Um, there's actually, and I always mention this because it's absolutely ridiculous, they created a um, YouTube video about the fentanyl. It's called Ensys or something along those lines. And they dubbed it over an ASAP Rocky track and sang and rap about how great this this new uh, fentanyl uh, spray was and how it could just cure everything that you ever needed it to cure. And in the music video, not only are they rapping and they're dancing and they're having a good time, but they also have a dancing mascot fentanyl spray in the music video. And if you go on YouTube and you just type in, you know, um, fentanyl... Um, nasal spray music video it'll pop right up they actually used this in their court um dispositions a couple months ago now uh, and they were just indicted and charged with their role in fueling the opioid epi- op- uh, the opioid epidemic and so you can see how just people were really making a lot of money off of it and they were really promoting it to individuals as a cure-all and people really weren't understanding what, what they were getting into at that time um they both act on the brain very similar ways Uh, Fentanyl traditionally has not shown up on routine general drug tests. I'm assuming that's going to change going forward because of its presence right now. Um, We're seeing it up the East Coast, all over the place, uh, particularly in high um, traffic areas in terms of highways. So Lawrence, Lowell area has been very much impacted by it. Um, Some of the borders where people are just easily able to um, drive and, and manufacture it. And why people are really prone to making fentanyl right now is that it's much cheaper to manufacture and distribute than it is heroin. So what they're doing is that they're mixing the heroin with fentanyl, but making it at a heroin price. So there's a lot more of an overhead for drug dealers to sell a lot of this product. It's very addictive. It's getting new customers, and they're making a lot more money on their end. On the other side, they're losing a lot of their customers because they're dying because of fentanyl's real potency. Um, But in conversations we've had with some individuals who are living with addiction, you know, they said the new, the fentanyl high is a newer high that they haven't experienced before. So individuals, although they know that fentanyl is very dangerous and very risky, they're still seeking it out because of that moment, momentarily, momentarily high that they get than what they would have had compared to the last dose of heroin or whatever they may have been using at that time. Um, so where overdose from, there we go. One more time. Uh, Where overdose from opioids usually occur within one to three hours as a process, uh, fentanyl overdoses can occur as little as five to ten minutes. So you may have seen maybe back in October, November of last year um, in New Haven, Connecticut, there was a large ration of um, overdoses uh, from individuals in a park. And what happened was the individuals had bought K2, synthetic marijuana, and it was laced with fentanyl. They did not want fentanyl. They did not know that they were getting fentanyl. They just thought they were getting synthetic marijuana. And they started to overdose in droves at, in the park. It was also covered in uh, Grey's Anatomy, if you, for those who watch uh, TV. Uh, who doesn't watch that? Um, but it, was, it, it can come off as dramatized in, in some of those medical shows. But that one was actually pretty accurate, where newscasters were interviewing EMTs and police chiefs and everything, and individuals were overdosing in the background. So you could see the camera kind of pan away. And they honestly didn't have enough bodies or enough staff to handle that demand they weren't prepared for it who was who would be prepared for something like that something like 70 people overdosed um the last time i looked it up i think it was around 70 to to 80 people who overdosed in it's like an hour span or something like that so and even fentanyl um are using narcan is not as effective as it is with heroin as it is with fentanyl so the stronger the potency of the drug the harder it the more narcan you may need to give somebody to combat the uh, other drug that's in their system so uh, it's potent and it's out there and try not to be the doom and gloom person but it's just important for us to mention because i think you're going to see a lot more of it going forward Um, so here's a graphic that shows the amount required for a lethal overdose of heroin, which is on the left, and then the amount required on the right. You can see that the fentanyl is barely anything in there. And if you can mix a little bit of this with a little bit of that and sell it for the price of the heroin, you're making a lot of money and you're keeping customers because of the addictive qualities. Um, So it's a pretty starking, I would say, image, or a pretty um, striking image that a lot of people uh, don't really understand until they see it visually. So here in Massachusetts, between 2014 and 2018, this would be the boring statistics part, but I'll try to keep it as lively as possible for everybody. Um, What we are seeing is that uh, opioid-related overdose deaths with fentanyl present has been on the rise since 2014. So if you see this 
blue line right here, it's been going steadily up since 2014. Likely heroin, or majority of it being heroin, is actually on the decline. So it's kind of talking to our point just now about fentanyl being mixed in with, with heroin. Um, it's, it's actually the most common specific drug present right now in op opioid-related opioid overdose deaths. So we like to make a distinction here. You know, you'll see on the news in politicians, people kind of misrepresent some of this information sometimes depending on what data they have. So there is a difference between non-fatal and fatal overdoses. Non-fatal, you know, an excessive and dangerous dose of a drug that doesn't lead to a death and the opposite fatal where it does lead to a death. So when you're hearing statistics, you're seeing people talk about it on the news, you want to differentiate between which one they're talking about because while, non, while fatal overdoses have been steadily are starting to decline, I should say, um, probably because of the widespread access of Narcan. We're, we're hoping in the education and awareness around it. Uh, Non-fatals have been relatively stable, um, and they haven't really dipped too much or as much as people would like. Uh, so it can be a little bit misleading. Like They're not just all miraculously not happening anymore. It's just that we're seeing fewer people pass away uh, because Narcan is available and people are using it. Uh, and we already had mentioned this, so... True or false? This may come up a little funky um, because the way that we usually do it, it comes in individually, and I think it's going to come in all at once. But um, if I can remember them correctly, do you remember what the first one is? Okay. Leave the person. I'm going to do it real quick. You don't look at the screen. Uh, true or false? Should you leave a person alone if they are overdosing? Feels like a pretty easy question. Yes. So you do not want to leave them alone because they could stop breathing. You want to have be able to get them access in that moment. So that is false. The next one, uh, okay, look away real quickly. Okay, should you put somebody in a bathtub? I see a no over here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I got a no. False. All right. So it is false. So the reason why we like to talk about that is because you'll see in movies and dramatization a lot of people saying, put them in the bathtub, put them in the bathtub. Yeah, or, in a, or in a shower. In the shower, turn the, turn the cold water on, something like that. To shock them to shock their system. Yeah, you shouldn't do that. Um, because the person could drown if you put them in a bathtub. Um, the next one is put ice down their pants. Thoughts? It already says it there. Um, no. And it's similar to the bathtub, where if you are putting, uh, your body's already shutting down at that point. What did you say? You said it, it can work. It can work. Correct. Yeah, your body's already going through a lot. It's shutting down with an overdose relation, uh, related uh, overdose. But by putting this, you're actually going to be impacting your bodily function in a negative way because your body was not expecting to be so cold in that moment. The next one's vomiting, yes. So should you induce vomiting or try to get them to eat? Got a no, no. Correct, yes. So it is false, and it's because you don't want the individual to choke on their food. For those who are Seinfeld fans, please tell me I still have some Seinfeld fans in the room. Okay. <laughs> Usually I do that, and people are like, what? Probably because we are younger crowds when we did that at the high school. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. All right. All right. Well, in hey, office is good. Don't, don't, don't hate. <laughs> So what I was gonna say, what I was going to get at is there's a scene early on in one of the episodes where Elaine's dating an older gentleman and he passes out. I think he has a stroke, and they're trying to figure out how to respond to that. And they're like, "Give him something to eat. Give him something to eat." And they try to get a cookie, and they're trying to man manually chew his jaw. And they're like, "How's he gonna cho How's he gonna swallow it?" And then the EMTs come and they go, "Why has the guy got cookies in his mouth?" And it's because they thought that you should give him something to eat to try to revive them. Um, don't do that. Um, you shouldn't have anything that's blocking the airway. If anything, you should be clearing the airway. Um, but we like to throw that in there as much as can. And then the last one is try to stimulate someone even if it may cause them harm. And so this is punch them, kick them, slap them around, stuff like that. Anything to get them to wake up. <laughs> I, I see a nod. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it is false. And the reason why is you obviously don't want to cause any more harm that's already, than already the person's experiencing that moment. There is a response, and there is something that you can do to get them to respond. The sternal rub. The, we got people, informed crowd, glad to know. <laughs> um, that, well, that should result in the individual responding to that. It's pretty painful. Sarah usually demonstrates it on herself and forgets how painful it is, and she has a red mark on her chest, and I have to remind her every time not to do it. Um, and... 
in the winter months when you may have layers, it's good to try and stimulate on the top, <laughs> on, on top of the lip or across the eyebrow. I would say the most effective is these, one of these two and then this one if at all ends cost. I want to, <laughs> any particular reason why you had that reaction? <laughs> So if someone is experiencing an overdose, they're probably not going to respond to that because uh, their body is starting to shut down. And if you are a alive or conscious, uh, you will respond to that because right, it hurts. Right, that's the thing. Right? Chest, like, yeah, they don't feel bad, then. It's a very unlikely they're that they're not experiencing yeah. an overdose, correct. So they're all false. Typically, this comes in nice, neat flash, and my OCD is off the charts right now, but <laughs> I'm dealing with it. We're, we'll, we'll power through. Thank you, Erica. <laughs> It really is. All right, so for, for statistics for Massachusetts, so this is from 2015. These are confirmed and estimated opioid-related overdose deaths for the last three years, basically. So as you can see, it's been fairly steady, um, but with a little bit of a giant leap in quarter two of 2017. So that's basically uh, February, April, June of 2017. Um, and then it's kind of started to go down a little bit and starts trending in the right direction, but there's still a lot of work to be done, clearly. 424 confirmed uh, over overdose deaths in Massachusetts alone is, is a lot. Yeah. I would think, though, like, it, it makes it only look like the guy can't sell it a little bit, mm -hmm. but with the fentanyl and the cocaine and stuff, that number would probably be going like this right now if it weren't for Narcan. Correct, yeah. This number could be astronomical, I would say, if, if Narcan was not available for folks. Um, so we look at it for here in Somerville. Um, this is just a, a map that shows across the city where overdoses occurred in 2017, 2018. This does not mean Somerville residents. This just means individuals who overdosed in Somerville. So it could be someone from Cambridge who was here or Everett, Malden, Medford, wherever it may be. So the purple dots are those that are non-fatal and the red are fatal. Um, so you could see um, it's kind of widely spread throughout the city. We, we like to put this up there pri primarily to show individuals that it can occur at any place. There's no real pocket of it even. You know, you have a couple areas where it may be a little bit more. Um, and so you can see Miss uh, Assembly Row over here. Um, and so some of the pockets that we have seen, like in the Davis Square area, Mystic, uh, or this area, we trying to get, understand why. And one of the thing is transportation, public transportation, and, and the, the train system, uh, individuals there. Um, and then th maybe like homeless areas or in areas where individuals um, are just more prone to overdose retailers. Interestingly enough, actually, I was at the uh, DA Marion Ryan's t opioid task force right before I came here today. And the new data is showing that in 2017, prior to 2017, most overdoses that they were seeing were occurring in public bathrooms, in parking lots, on the streets, things like that. And now about 70% of the overdoses they're seeing are happening in the home. Um, and people are alone most of the time. So we'll get into that. Sarah will talk a little bit about that risk factor of using alone. Um, but yeah. So, so the two, does that mean one person died and one person did not? No, the two just means multiple. So, so the purple and half red, you know what I mean? Oh, you mean over here? So that's two that died. And oh, right here. Like this, yeah. Does that mean Possible. one it's po no, it was possible it, that it was related to opioids. Um, th they have to make a determination, the EMTs and the, the um, fire police. I know that was you're the first one to notice that, um, where they have to make a determination, and some of them are pending until the medical examiner's office is able to go through all of this. So I could probably get a little bit of an updated version. I bother our police department all the time to get this data as much as possible, so I try to not burn that bridge when I can. Um, but I have a meeting with them next week, so that's great. Um, but we, it's, it's something that's happening all over the place. Um, and not over, all over the place. I shouldn't, that's, that doesn't, not what I meant. Uh, I think it's more so that it could happen at any time, anywhere, and there's not one place or one area that's more prone to it than others. Um, I do think that it is concerning that individuals now are starting to overdose more in their house, um, particularly because either if they're alone or, um, their parents or their friends or whoever may just not recognize or know what the signs and symptoms are. So Sarah gets into that a little bit shortly. Uh, so for Somerville fatal overdoses uh, from 2012 to 2018, 
Um, we see a trend where it increased between 2015 and 2016, and then it started to decline since 2016. So we're heading in the right direction. I'm glad to see this. I think that still a lot of work needs to be done in this regard. Um, I actually think this number is now down to seven because they did were able to verify it since we first got this. Stole my point. Correct. Yep. Took my point. You're head of the, head of the game. <laughs> You're right, though. That's exactly what um, fentanyl started to become much more present and much more prevalent around this area. And I think once we saw that jump up, then people started doing a lot more, especially with Narcan being available and understanding what fentanyl is and kind of things like that. So um, another thing about fentanyl is that um, they're, they've come out with test strips. I don't know if folks have heard about this. It's a harm reduction technique where individuals, I think it was in Baltimore and Burlington, Vermont, very interesting two places to have them, um, who have been piloting and distributing fentanyl test strips for, in, for active individuals who are using um, heroin or fentanyl so that they can test the drug before they actually ingest it to see if there's fentanyl present in it. Thinking that maybe if they knew that fentanyl was in it when they didn't really want it to be in it, they may think otherwise putting it into their body. Uh, we're actually, we're here in Somerville, we're thinking about piloting that as well, um, particularly with fentanyl being so present. Limitation is it doesn't tell you how much fentanyl is in it. It just tells you that it's present. So the hope is that maybe I see it's present. I might not want to, to put my life at risk. Other end of it is somebody may be so desperate for, for whatever it may be at that time that they may say, okay, I know it. I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, yeah. I think a lot of places too, right, in Massachusetts now, mm -hmm. I think it's just it's in the place of that like, you don't know that they're getting fentanyl. Like you're actually asking, hey, you know what, I need some fentanyl. Yep. It's a little bit what I was saying earlier where it's the new thing. It's the newer high that gets you higher than heroin. So it may explain some of the heroin decreases with fentanyl just being the drug of choice right now. Uh, good point. And then just for non-fatal, uh, we can see it's followed a similar trend as fatal. So uh, the blue line on the bottom is the non-fatal opioid involved. The others are other narcotics. Um, and you can see that it steadily increased to 2016 and then have decreased since um, the last two, three, two, two years. So I'm um, hoping that trend stays and it keeps going in that way, that direction. Um, but a lot of work like this and a lot of education, advocacy, policy level stuff needs to be done to continue that effort. Uh, one last thing before I stop talking for a little bit and you get to enjoy Sarah um, is the demographics. So we like to just look at kind of what ages this is impacting. Um, and so we're seeing non-fatal overdoses around 30 to 34 and then fatal between 35 and 39 and 60 to 64. Um, so I'm going to make, make a plug. Do not ever say that 60 to 64 is elderly. People will get upset. Um, <laughs> So I mistakenly said elderly at a, at a training, and the individual who's in the front row just happened to be 60 years old and said, I'm not elderly. Um, but the reason why we think with the 60 to 64, and Sarah likes to mention this, is that you, you uh, think you can still live in your prime or you're playing sports the way you are or doing things that you just used to doing all your time, and your body's starting to kind of catch up time. Father time is catching up to you. Where, or if you're having a lot of surgeries for related things and you're getting access to opioids that you wouldn't have had access before, um, you know, you may be more likely to have these drugs around for maybe the individual who's not seeking out heroin or something, heroin or something like that. Um, but I actually, again, at that conference that I went to this morning with the DA's office, it's still tr uh, very similar in terms of ages across the county, Middlesex County, where I think the average age was around 35. And she was talking about how you know, the face of the epidemic has been like it's a 20 to 30 year old issue. Um, and it's, it's, it is, it's an issue, but it's not, it's more than just, you know, young, young adults. It's adults, young adults who are aging as well. Uh, I'm trying to say it in the nicest way. So no, someone doesn't tell me that I'm being mean to elderly. Um, I love our elderly. They respect, you should respect them. Um, so, uh, yet that's true. We are going to the council on aging next week. So I got to change that before the, before I get to them. Um, and then one thing we found from Georgetown University was 53% of 18 to 34 year olds, 75% of 50 to 64 year olds, and 91% of adults over the age of 80 uh, use prescription medication. Um, so that's a pretty large amount of, of individuals for various reasons. Now we're not saying this is for opioid, like heroin or fentanyl, um, but this could be your Percocets, your um, 
oxycontin things like that for various pain management things um and then there was also a recent study out about marijuana and opioids and a kind of, you know, can they be a safer alternative? The research is still in development on that. There hasn't really been any evidence, but right now the latest one I think said there hasn't been any evidence to show that that could help be an alternative for pain management. So we'll see. Well, there's no definitive answer on that, but those are things that are coming down the pipeline. And... We like to say that says anyone can be a first responder. So that's been the basis of our training so that anybody at any time could feel more comfortable to respond. Um, so now that I gave you, oh, there's one more thing. Forgot about that. Um, the one thing I like to end on um, at least is to start talking about how we are using the language around uh, addiction and individuals who are living with addiction. So. The stigma, as we all know, is very, very real and individuals are judged pretty heavily on their um, their addiction and, and their lifestyle. And, you know, for the longest time we've seen it as people trying to posit it as a moral failing, um, and that the individual is some, some reason is a bad person or that they just, you know, for whatever reason. But I like to think of it and we like to encourage people to think about it as imagine being defined as the one thing that you feel the most anxious about or the most um, shame about or the thing that, you know, you just, you're more than just an addiction or you're just more than just one thing. And so where we put this on here is just to start using language about individuals who are living with addiction in a more person-centered way. So eliminating some of the words around addict, junkie, druggie, and replacing it with person with a substance use disorder, or ex-addict, taking that out and putting, saying person living in recovery. Um, and so these are just ways, and we will send this out to folks too, it's just, it takes time to start changing the narrative and the way that we talk about individuals, especially when it's been ingrained in our, our culture or the way that people are doing it. Um, or it's just a lot longer to say person with a substance use disorder than it is to say addict or junkie. But the connotation and the sentiment behind it can be so negative when you're just defining a person as this one sole thing that we were really encouraging folks to start to incorporate some of the say this and not that. And I've even found myself as I've done this, I've said um, suffering or struggling with an addiction. So I've made it a point to every time I say anything about an individual living with an addiction, I say individual living with an addiction. Uh, because the more I say it or the more other people say it, the more likely other people will pick that up and start saying that too. So, uh, I don't know if you can be adopted. And I think that's the reason why it's harder to be adopted is that people, it's not, doesn't flow off the tongue as much as maybe some of these shorter. Because you can see the words on the right are a lot less than the words on the left. So very good point. Thank you. All right. Now you can stop hearing me talk for a little bit then I come back. Yeah, he comes back. <laughs> He's not talking about um, So like Matt briefly mentioned, um, one of the biggest risk factors um, is using a loan, which statistics are showing that, that people are more typically using these days in their, the privacy of their own home, friend's home, whatever it may be. So that's one of the highest risk factors because there is no one there to administer Narcan or Naloxone to the person or there to call for help even if they don't have Narcan available. Um, another risk factor is mixing drugs. So whether you're using an opioid in addition to drinking alcohol, smoking marijuana, uh, amphetamines, whatever else um, someone may be using, mixing one drug with another completely overwhelms the body um, to the point where it just doesn't know what to do and could just shut down. Um, Those are fresh off, fresh off the press statistics, <laughs> 88%. Um, and physical health, so if you can think back to that graph or that chart that Matt showed with the potency and all of that, those are numbers that I like to point out are probably based on a typical average size, perfectly healthy white male, most likely. Nobody fits into that category, like maybe a half a percentage of America. So everyone's physical health, you're already at risk just in general. So if you've recently been sick, lost weight, gained weight, you know, years of drinking or using drugs um, and any of your bodily functions have slowed down even just genetically with age, as you age, um, also puts you at a higher risk. 
um, the differences in strength and content um, because it's clearly not an FDA approved medication. Heroin, you don't know what you're getting when you buy anything off the street. And like Matt had mentioned, um, they mix it with fentanyl or any other type of drug to sort of stretch out their product, but still make the most profit. Um, as well as tolerance changes. So if you don't use in as little as 72 hours or three days, your body sort of resets itself. So when you go back to using um, a drug, your body's not used to that substance in it anymore, so you're already putting yourself at a higher risk. Um, so it's important to sort of start slowly as a harm reduction technique to build up tolerance again if that's somewhere, something that you're doing. Um, and then we just like to throw in here that when you're released from a facility, whether it be jail, a rehab, hospital, whatever it may be, um, similar to um, attempted suicide, you're at 120 times more likely to overdose within the first two weeks of discharge. So that's a very high number. So we just like to let that resonate with you for a second. Um, so here are some of the typical signs and symptoms, most of which you guys, because like I said, this is probably one of the most informed group of people that we've had this training with, which included a group of nurses. So I'm giving you guys a lot of credit. Um, no offense to my colleagues. But <laughs> Um, so the heavy nod, which is sort of um, what you would typically think of, um, a tinted skin tone, whether it be blue or grayish in the fingertips, around the lips, um, really pale and sweaty, the choking or gurgling sound, which is more of like a, as a respiratory therapist. <laughs> I have some news on that, though. Oh, uh-oh. Okay. Um, is more of like a baby who has more of like an RSV sound. <laughs> He knows exactly what I'm talking about, but it's more of, it's not really snoring, but can be misconceived as snoring. Um, so I did get some breaking news this morning. Now. Um, so this gurgling snoring sound has actually been coming up a lot more with individuals who are overdosing in their, ho in their homes, um, where the parent or a family member who's in the house is reporting that they, they're hearing that noise, assuming that they're either asleep. So one of the statistics that the DA had talked about was that 19% of the uh, fatal overdoses that occurred in a house um, Oh, sorry, there has been a 19% decrease in the amount of o uh, fatal overdoses where gurgling or snoring was reported since they started telling folks about this um, one piece. And what was happening was individuals were saying, um, so-and-so came home, they said, I'm going to bed, I heard them snoring, I assumed they were sleeping, I went about my business, and I woke up the next morning and found out that they had overdosed. And so what they're saying now and they're pushing is that if you're hearing that gurgling or snoring sound, Get your Narcan ready, call 911 and go in if you can, because even if the person is just snoring, you'd rather them just, you know, check as a precaution than just assume the best and then have the worst. Um, so they're really pushing right now. Uh, if you hear that distress sound that you're going in, you're calling 911 to make sure the person's okay. I will have to remember that fact the next time we do this. Um, and like we had mentioned before, no response to painful stimulation, which we will teach you is not a kick to the head. It, it's a actual way to do it. Um, so we like to throw this out there as well um, because we've all seen somebody intoxicated, whether it be from alcohol or something. Um, so sort of the difference between the two. So both will cause smaller pupils. Uh, if someone's intoxicated, they may be drowsy, but they're still arousable if you call their name. Uh, where if you're overdosing, you're not arousable and you don't respond to the sternal rub, um, which is your knuckles as hard as you can. Um, in the center of somebody's chest. They'll show you a really poor sternal rub in a second. Um, the speech is slurred if you're intoxicated versus not speaking at all. And uh, a person's normal respiratory rate is 12 to 20. So with intoxication, it slows down to about eight um, times per minute. Whereas your breathing has either stopped or it's less than eight times per minute. So their breathing is not only shallow, but it's also very, very slowed. And their lips may be tinted blue if they're more lighter complexed versus gray if you're more darker complex. <laughs> um, if you're intoxicated, stimulate and observe. And if you're overdosing, give naloxone, rescue breathing, and call 911. Um, 911 will, I'm not going to say never yell at you, but um, be mad at you if you call and they're not overdosing. It may just be somebody 
had a little bit too much to drink, but you know what, for your good conscience, you called and it's fine. Let's see what happens. Oh, it's not working? So this is just, yeah, this, this is just a quick video. It's a couple minutes um, just to sort of show you all um, a few of the signs and symptoms and then gives a good visual of what um, Narcan or Naloxone actually does to a person's body. Let's begin with understanding what an opioid overdose is I think and you how it affects the body. We apologize. <laughs> Opioids work by interacting with receptors in our brain. The opioids fit into these receptor sites, sort of like a key fits in a lock. What makes opioids potentially so dangerous is that these same receptors ensure we keep breathing. An overdose happens when more and more opioid molecules latch onto these receptors, overwhelming the brain's ability to keep us breathing properly or even at all. Because someone suffering from an opioid overdose may appear to be simply sleeping, it's important to know the signs to look for, specifically, breathing becomes very slow and shallow, erratic, or has stopped. Snoring or gurgling sounds are made. Pupils become pinpoints. There is a loss of consciousness. The person is unresponsive to outside stimulus. The body is limp. Pulse is slow, erratic, or not there at all. The face is pale and clammy. Fingers and lips turn blue or purple, and the person may also experience vomiting. An opioid overdose deprives the body of oxygen, which can cause vital organs, especially the brain, to shut down. After three to five minutes without oxygen, brain damage starts to occur, soon followed by death. Fortunately, there is a medication that can temporarily combat opioid overdose symptoms, buying critical time for paramedics to arrive. Naloxone is a competitive antagonist to opioids. It works by knocking the opioids off the brain receptors they latch onto, allowing the person to breathe again and temporarily reverses the overdose. Do a little visual of what. Absolutely nothing, and it comes up in one of the slides, <laughs> but nothing will happen. Um, Matt usually likes to tell people I sprayed Narcan in his face, which I did, so it's not a lie. Uh, and nothing, nothing will happen to you. What's <laughs> It's a little bit now, <laughs> it's totally fine. So if you suspect an overdose, um, and you, when you call 911, tell the operator the person's not breathing, they may, be, it may, they may be overdosing, and stay with the person and remain calm. If you, and hopefully once Matt goes over the Good Samaritan law, you won't feel like you'll just abandon a person, and I would assume you wouldn't since you're all here. Um, at least put the person in the recovery position, which is the next slide, um, and leave the door unlocked so first responders can come in. Um, to perform rescue breathing, you tilt their head back open their, to open their airway and give two quick breaths and then a breath every five seconds. Um, and then to administer the Narcan, this isn't actually the one we give you, um, but you administer it through the nose. Uh, the old one, which we just grabbed from you, <laughs> you do it half in one nostril, half in the other. Um, but the one we have is just in one nostril, so we make it easier for you. Um, we like to say that if you do need to call 911, calling from a landline, which we know is a thing almost of the past, is better because they're able to connect you directly to the Somerville um, EMS. Whereas if you call from a cell phone, it will send you to the state, then that's why they ask where you are, and then they transfer you um, to Somerville. I will, con I will continue. I will continue to say this every time we do this training how the hell Uber and Lyft find you, like down to the exact location, but 911 can't, I have zero idea. Like absolutely no idea how that's a thing, but it is. So we need to call them and get their technology to 911. Um, or if you guys remember, 911 was down a few months ago. Actually, it might've been longer ago than that. Yeah, I remember that too. My phone was going crazy. Um, it was overwhelmed, yeah. <laughs> Sounds safe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so rescue breathing, this just shows you again what it is. Make sure there's nothing in their mouth, head tilt, chin lift. Um, if you're CPR certified or have been recently, they do tell you to no longer do rescue breathing. It's all about compression. But as you saw in that video, within three to five minutes, you start to lose brain function. So with an overdose, br rescue breathing and breathing um, every five seconds is very important to keep the brain stimulated. 
Um, so if you are CPR certified, it does contradict that a little bit. Um, so you want to make sure the person gets um, oxygen and you want to do rescue breathing or CPR to the extent of your training. Do not go above and beyond. There are some people who are trained a little bit more. That is totally fine. <laughs> Uh, the recovery position is exactly a side sleeper position, which most of us are, I'm sure, uh, except Matt, apparently. Uh, that's weird. Uh, so you just want to make sure your leg is bent um, and the opposite arm goes across their body to leave the person on that side in case after uh, Narcan is administered, they may vomit so that they don't choke on the vomit. So what is Narcan? Do you usually do this? Nope. Okay. What is Narcan? <laughs> so it's a drug that reverses an opioid overdose. It blocks opioids from attaching to the receptors in the brain, which you just saw in that video. Um, it has no other effects on the body, cannot be used to get high. Someone cannot overdose on Narcan. There's no potential for abuse of Narcan. And all pharmacies here in Massachusetts have a standing order for Narcan, uh, which you complained about and you've complained about many times. Despite them having a standard order for it, it is very expensive. Uh, so you all will be leaving here with free Narcan. Um, and you can, yes it is. It depends, uh, your... it depends on your insurance too. So if you try to get it without your insurance, it's about $130. If you get it through your insurance, which I just randomly was like, let's see if this is real, went to uh, Walgreens and it was $25 through my insurance. You don't need a prescription, so they have a standing order for it. So what Walgreens did at least was just add it to my chart. They gave it to me and were like, do you need help on knowing how to administer this? I was like, no, definitely don't, but thank you. Um, so yeah, it was 20, and I have Tufts through the city. Um, I do know it's free if you have Mass Health, and I do know you can get it through all insurances every two weeks. Um, and that's also something that's being worked on right now. Um, because insurance companies are starting to say that it was a, um, oh my God, what is the word for it? Uh, undisclosed previous pre health, pre-existing condition, if you're going in and getting Narcan every two weeks. But a lot of people, like I had mentioned to you before this training even started, go in and get it and pass it out to people who may not care to go or may say it's too expensive or may think they don't need it. Um, but that is something that the, um, oh my God, Mara Healy, what's she? Attorney General. Attorney General is fighting with insurance companies about, um, I always mix up Attorney General and ADA or she DA, um, <laughs> who's who, but um, is fighting with insurance companies about right now saying that it's a pre-existing condition, which is good. Did someone have a question? So you don't, ha you don't have to have a prescription, but they do, yeah. You can just walk in and they have it, and it's at this link that you really can't see. It's like between three to three dollars for the two, like it's mass health and it's mm -hmm. not Yep. Oh, okay. um, and in the little kit that we give you is, because I'm a nurse and crazy, is the standing order for it, so. Um, and that's something they just started of October of last year, so it will renew every October. So right today we're only, because we have limited funding up until thankfully July 1st, we have more funding. Uh, we run on a fiscal year here in the city of Somerville. Uh, we're just giving one, unfortunately. Um, but if you use it or it expires, which this I believe expires July, July of 2020, um, feel free to call us and as long as we still have some, we're, we're we will replenish it. It's July 2020, so if you use it or it expires, July 2020, not yeah. Like next not next month, month. No, uh, 13 months. Uh, so just a little bit more on naloxone. It's active for 30 to 90 minutes in the body. If you give someone um, naloxone to reverse the opioid um, overdose, uh, it may wear off before the opioids wear off, so you may need to give them um, the second dose because um, it depends on how quickly somebody's body metabolizes, how much they used, and however, how well their liver is processing it. Um, but the plus is if the person tries to use again, like that video showed, it'll um, just kind of knock it off. Um, and it's possible that it does cause withdrawal symptoms, so the 
the sweatiness, the sh like shaking or things like that. Um, but thankfully in Somerville, it, there is such a quick response time. Um, it's five to seven minutes long. It's, yeah, it depends, yeah. Um, it's a, I don't know if anyone's had to call 911. I'm sure most of you guys ha have had to. It's the longest five to seven minutes, three to five minutes of your life. Um, but, but Somerville does thankfully have a good response time, which is good. Yeah, um, I know. I know. They'll, they'll find you. And get to they'll find you. So, so there is a, a substation here um, of the police station because of um, the Washington Street Bridge out. They've made a, a fire department substation as well, and they're, they're trying. Hopefully, this green line is worth all the crazy. But anyways, um, and it's kind of cut off right there, but we just like to point out, too, that Narcan's safe for administration to children. It's not a half a dose. It's the same exact dose administered the same exact way. Um, if for some reason um, a child may get into somebody's stash or whatever it may be, um, which has happened, unfortunately, there was an article or someone was talking about a story where a child was visiting her dad in like a sober house or halfway house or something along those lines, got into something and was administered, I think it was 11 doses of Narcan. Um, so you can't overdose on Narcan. Uh, we don't know the specifics, whether people just, it was a child, they saw a child, they gave her a lot of Narcan because they really wanted to help her or she needed the 11 doses, it's kind of unsure, but the child was um, okay, thankfully. Um, so it is good, or it is okay to administer to children. Um, so people typically, and you can attest to this more because you said you've seen it uh, more times in the ER, um, or even you've mentioned that they've had to use Narcan on you. Um, most awaken solely after two doses. Sometimes they experience, or sometimes if fentanyl's involved, you may need to be administered more. Um, most often people feel confused or embarrassed. Just let them know that they're okay. You were given Narcan and ambulance is on its way. Um, sometimes, again, you have those withdrawal symptoms, which tends to be more rare. Yeah. Um, and then this, I'd love to get your, you guys' opinions on this. Um, it shows about 36% of people out of a sample size of over 8,600. Um, nothing typically happens. Uh, they just wake up and w they're confused and don't really know, like didn't know they overdosed, didn't know what, like where they are, why they're awake, what's going on. Um, about 15% feel dope sick and want to use again. Uh, about 3% will vomit uh, with the 15% irritable or angry. That's verbally irritable or angry, not the physical type, um, which is the lowest percentage on here which is about 2%, um, which we have heard is the reason why people don't want to, is one of the reasons why people don't want to administer Narcan, because the person just sh comes up, wakes up, is extra violent, such punching you, kicking you, and then runs away. We're not saying it doesn't happen, it's just the least frequent thing that happens. Um, we're not asking you to be superheroes, we're not asking you to be the police, if that does happen, let the person run away. You've done your due diligence. Still call the police. Let them know, hey, I administered Narcan to a middle-aged gentleman who's about 5'7", brown hair. And, you know, they may go on the lookout for him. Just don't chase after them and put yourself in danger. We just do like to let people know that it is something that could happen. It's just the least frequent thing that happens. If you see it in movies or on TV, they love to dramatize things. So what pays their bills. <laughs> um, so the types of naloxone. So there is the multi-step one, and I can't hold that too, so there's too many things to hold. The multi-step one, which we stole from you because I've lost all of my pieces. Um, no, I was gonna use hers to show, because I gotta open it all. So the multi-step one, which is the one on the left up here, comes in a box and the atomizer, which is just the fancy way name for the thing that goes up your nose. And then it comes in a vial with the Narcan in it, plus the plunger. So you have to take this yellow cap off, open this. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. Put the atomizer on, take this yellow cap off, take this purple cap off, 
twist this on till it can't twist no more. <laughs> and then this is the one. You think you, I haven't dropped any of it. Usually I drop pieces and I'm not even stressed. And then this is the one where you have to put half in one nostril, half in the other. We are not giving you this one. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, so the one that we are giving you is this single step nasal spray, which again, I accidentally sprayed in Matt's face, which is this, oh no, this is the trainer one. So it just comes in a package like this. So you'll each get this with the little foil pack. You undo the foil pack, take it out. Once you hit this trigger, it will automatically all go in one nostril. So these are just training ones. So you can just, they're essentially this um, thing, which just looks exactly the same as the ones that we will be giving you, which is nice. <laughs> um, they do come in a two pack if you get it from the pharmacy, but again, our limited funding only allows us to give you one. <laughs> um, the plus to this is, however, um, because we did just take hers from her, um, she did get two in it. The single step is what you'll typically get from the pharmacy now and what everyone's kind of leaning towards. It is a higher milligram, um, which they've noticed works better, especially with the presence of more potent drugs out there. So the multi-step one was only two milligrams per um, dose that you would give somebody, whereas this is now uh, four milligrams. And that was two milligrams in two milliliters, and now this is four just in one milliliter. So they have learned from their ways because that's what pharmaceutical companies do. They just outdo each other. But in this case, it was better, so it's totally fine. <laughs> um, this just shows you the breakdown. It makes it look simple, but you guys just saw me try to assemble it. It's really not that simple. <laughs> and then again, this makes this look a lot harder than it really is. <laughs> so I don't understand these graphics. But um, in each of these, it does um, explain the steps of it as well that we'll give to you. And then like you mentioned, you jumped ahead. You guys are too good. Uh, you can do it intramuscularly. So this is a new, it's called Evzio. It's not as new anymore and it's getting more readily available. Um, it talks to you and you can administer it um, in somebody's thigh, which is nice. So once you take it out of the case, this it talks. Contains no needle or drug. Beep, beep. If you are ready to use, pull off red safety guard. To inject, place black end against outer thigh. And you can do it through somebody's clothes. It doesn't matter much like an EpiPen. Um, we like to put, <laughs> so we'll pass that, oh, I didn't put this. The same amount of time, typically 13 months. Um, those are just a lot more expensive. Um, they've come down in price, which is nice, um, but they're still pricey, but you can get that. Um, so the multi-step one is about, how did I figure it out? It's like six, those are 230, I think. Or two, no, 170. Whereas the ones we're giving you a t for one of those, for two of those, yeah. Um, with insurance. With insurance, the ones that Matt just passed out to you, you get a two pack for 30. With insurance, two pack of that is 170, so. That's why you're not getting those from the city of Samuel, sorry. Um, the plus to this, and this is honestly just my own theory behind it, but this may be easier, um, and I would love to get opinions of it, this may be easier if to give to somebody who was actively using drugs, because it may be easier for them to administer that to themselves as opposed to putting it up their nose. That's my personal thought, but I don't know. I could just make stuff up. And then the final way that you can get Narcan is what um, the EMTs and paramedics carry around with them um, are vials of Narcan and they draw it up and administer it to you or the same as they would in the hospital. We thought this was, own, was not given out to lay people. However, one of the trainings we did, they were given a single dose vial of it plus a syringe to carry around. I can, t I can tell you right now, nowhere is doing that anymore. But that, I think the girl said she did that like five to seven years ago. And you would inject it in their thigh or in their arm just like you would. That shocked the crap out of me, but 
they did that. And I was also confused too because there's syringe tips in that bag that I just took from you, but there's nothing to attach them to. So I don't know why they're in there. But okay, I was gonna ask you that, but now I'm just calling it out on the spot. <laughs> so sorry. That's one, one thing we, she usually highlights is just, you know, you don't want to be like on top of the person the entire time. So, you know, if you give the Narcan, take a step back, put them in the recovery position on their side. And then if you start seeing them come, come to consciousness, you know, you can assure them like, hey, I, I, you, I thought you, you, were, you experienced an overdose or you, you're overdosing. You're okay. I administered some Narcan. You know, the police or the EMTs are on their way. Maybe go EMTs first because police, they may think that they're going to get in trouble. Um, but we'll talk about that, why that won't be the case. But yeah, just give some space, but also don't leave them alone uh, if you feel comfortable. We always say do whatever you feel most comfortable doing. So if that means you call 911, you give the Narcan, you put them in the, the recovery position and you don't stay, you know, that's more than what somebody else would have done. And we like to refer to the bystander effect. Don't assume that somebody else is going to don't have called 911 or have already intervened because, you know, you never know. And the uh, the EMTs or 911, they're going to say, you know, thank you for calling. Like somebody had called us about that. They're not going to say, why the heck did you call someone else already called? And if they do, that's their problem. Um, but at least you did what you could do in that moment. Yeah. I don't know if I said this, but there's some people who do wake up somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it goes right to the blood system, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sure. I can't imagine the, everything that goes into it. No. No, yeah. I mean, and, and that's what I think we're really trying to hope that people understand that, that you could inv intervene in those few minutes that you give someone Narcan could really make the difference between them surviving and or not surviving. And not to add that to your burden, you know, as, as, a, as a person who's just trying to go about their business, but if there are an opportunity for you to intervene, then this is hopefully making you feel more comfortable too. I was saying when I went to New York City a couple months ago and I was in Penn Station, there were three people that were having EMTs around them as I walked f basically from the entrance to my train. And someone had to have called 911 or intervened because they were all up and they had that like confused kind of uh, state. But it was either, they have a large police presence there, so maybe the officers were trained to spot them and then intervene, or there's a lot of bodegas, a lot of little shops. Hopefully people were there noticing the, the signs, or just somebody who was walking by and said, I don't, I, you know, I'm not sure what's going on with that person. You know, we're busy people. We try to get to our train. You know, if you're running late and stuff, you want to go, go, go. But we encourage that people take a second, you know, to, to try to help somebody survive in that moment. Uh, you never know. You know, if they were just under the influence of alcohol and they were just sleeping it off, Okay, that's one thing, but you know, you could actually play a key part um, in doing it. So, thank you for everybody's experiences. It's, it's certainly helpful to inform the conversation, and um, you know, it's it's nice when there's individuals who have some real life experience to talk about it because it kind of makes it a little bit more tangible for folks to understand that it's not just something we think about and we talk about and put on a PowerPoint slide. This is happening, and people are seeing it happen across the country, and especially here in Massachusetts. So. Um, one thing that will protect you is the Good Samaritan law. So it protects people who call 911 during an overdose from being charged with the possession of a controlled substance. So this is for the individual calling and the, or the individual who's experiencing the overdose. So it's a way for individuals, it's encouraging individuals to reach out because what um, police enforcement or EMTs, they're treating it as a medical emergency at that point. They're not treating it as a law or something that we need to uh, prosecute this person for possession of controlled substance. So. This chapter, or this law, you can go read it. It's very long, very dense language. It says, immunity from prosecution for persons seeking medical assistance for themselves or others experiencing a drug-related overdose. So it protects people from prosecution. It increases the likelihood that people will call 911, saves lives, and especially for medical professionals or just individuals who are carrying Narcan. It provides legal protection for medical professionals who prescribe naloxone or people who possess and or administer naloxone to someone appearing to have an opioid overdose. So it acts in good faith. The, the law is anticipating that you are doing it out of the, the best interest of the person to revive them in that moment. It's similar, like if you're doing uh, CPR and you may do it a little too low in cracker ribs or a little too hard in cracker ribs, it's the same idea where you can't be prosecuted for that because you are acting in the best interest of the person you're trying to save along the same line. 
you were saying? typically bring up the movie The Thief, which Sandra Bullock, that someone's coughing in IHOP, and they just need the Heimlich, but she gives them, like, a treat. Or you can't do that. Don't do that. Don't cut <laughs> off someone's arm like you don't know how to do it. <laughs> So if you're gonna, <laughs> so be the one to call. Not the one. So you calling won't get in trouble, even if you were using, and the person who is getting help. Right. So tell Johnny and Stevie and Sally to get out if they're not protected. <laughs> if you're worried about them. If you're worried about them. Yeah, and there are some limitations to it, which we'll talk about in a second. But did you have a comment? And literally yeah. all people who have died before that because law, people. And that's, I think, not, I, I think most people don't really know too, too much about this, this law, but it really is important for people to know. So take it with you in other spheres and other people that you may know that this will protect you to this extent. So there are some lim Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, yes, uh, yes. There are limitations, which I'll go over, but they're working on to increase people to want to call. Yeah, so do this within Massachusetts. <laughs> um, I'm assuming there's similar laws in other you never know. You've seen some other laws in other states. <laughs> Probably seen that on the news recently. Um, and then what it doesn't do, so it does not interfere with law enforcement securing the scene. So they have to do their job. They have to secure the scene and make, make sure everything's okay. Second, they does not prevent from prosecution of drug trafficking. So if someone overdoses here, someone calls here, and then there's a, pro a trafficking ring going on in the other room, they're going to pr prosecute that probably because that led to one or, you know, one and the other. And so they're not going to turn a blind eye to something that may impact more people um, than just, you know, one single overdose. It, but drug trafficking, they're going to take very seriously. Um, and then also it doesn't present, prevent from prosecution from outstanding warrants. So I think this is actually one of the biggest limitations of this because if individuals who are using drugs have any other warrant for child support or, I don't know, Anything that's even not even related to drugs, they will get prosecuted to that extent. Um, and so, you know, I don't know. I don't want to make a generalization that individuals who are struggling or see, see, I said it, who are living with addiction um, have more drug char or have more legal charges or have more legal involvement. But if they do, then this may be a limitation that they'd want to think about otherwise. So. Yeah, how do you reconcile that? Yeah, it's a good point, and I, I think it's it's tricky. I think it's complex, as we've talked about, and I think just knowing that you can get that person help in that moment without any repercussions for the person or for yourself will hopefully increase the likelihood people will call. I think medical industry laws are basically Interesting. That makes sense. Yeah. I was going to say, because yeah. then there's some social host laws that go into effect, too, with if you're hosting a party and giving drugs or alcohol to people, you will be liable for anything that comes out of it, like drunk driving or, or something like that, especially if they're underage. Um, but that's a whole other side of my job I can talk about with, <laughs> with people another time. Um, so there are some resources. So state level, there's BSAS, which actually funds a lot of our prevention work we do here in the city. Uh, and then there's a helpline for individu anybody to access at any time, toll free. Um, also, like I said, we'll send these out to folks so you don't have to like write these down or memorize all of them so that you can have them available. As long as you put your email on there and it's legible, I will make sure to get it to you. Um, you'll be surprised. Sometimes I'm going back and I try to type in the email and I'm like, is that an O or an A or an E? <laughs> uh, and then locally, there's, there's um, some grassroots organizations. So the Ryan Harrington Foundation, the Summer, uh, Alex Foster Foundation and the Somerville Overcoming Addiction, they are grassroots organizations that primarily work to help caregivers or individuals who have family members, friends who are struggling, or sorry, see, again, I messed up, living with addiction. Um, 
they've had a son or, or a family member pass away to to drug um, overdose. So um, they do a lot of work, especially with youth involvement and awareness and, and education for folks and families, um, some groups as well, support groups. So uh, you can find them here or give them a call. More is a, a more a Massachusetts um, organization for addiction recovery. They do a lot around policy and advocacy, uh, especially around like laws at the state house and things like that. So they're out there, they're big, and uh, you'll probably see them in some way, shape, or form now that I mentioned them. Uh, and then Learn to Cope is also a good resource for caregivers. They really do a lot of support groups for individuals, especially those who have um, become, they were grandparents and now they're becoming parents again, taking care of the kids that uh, were their, taking care of their grandkids. Um, and so there's a lot of work and support for those who are, you know, supposed to be in their glory days, living out their retirement, and now are going to be taking care of six, seven-year-olds until, you know, for the, until their parent, or if not, if they actually passed away, then, you know, they are the parent, and how that kind of plays into the stress and coping and kind of their own mental health. Um, so those are, those are resources that are out there. Additional trainings, we get the Boston Health Commission, uh, DPH, and then um, local departments like ourselves. This first one's a pretty good one. If you go online, it's kind of what we do here, but in a virtual type of form, and you can kind of walk through it. Uh, it goes step by step, and there's like questions at the end of each scenario. Uh, it's a video, so we did it when we first got trained, uh, and then we went to a live one like this. But it was a good one if you don't have time to come to one of these, you can just do it on there real quickly. They won't give you Narcan though, just saying. Um, and so we're part of the open network, so it's a coalition of four cities, so Cambridge, Everett, Somerville, and Watertown. Cambridge is the lead, we're just a part of it. And um, it allows us to do this work. I'm, I'm part of it, I'm the Somerville representative. Um, and so we do a lot of awareness, education, and advocacy. So this is part of our, our work, uh, as well as some other stuff around um, coping skills and in youth um, prevention stuff. And then the Somerville Police Department, because they give us all the stats and the data, and they do a lot of good work, as well as the fire department. We probably should throw them in there too. Um, but they, they do a lot of good work outside of just giving us data and taking care of these. Yes, correct. Correct. All, th all three of them. It's Cataldo. They're all responding. Fire trucks typically yep. show up. Typically first. first. And yep. I said that in training we had with the police department. Yeah. <laughs> the, mm -hmm. It's always the fire department. All our departments. Always. So. That's a good point. Whereas. And they're, and they're responding to a lot more diverse situations. It could be domestic abuse or domestic thing. It could be a cat. Well, that's probably, I was going to say that's probably the fire department, a cat in a tree. Uh, it could be any, any random thing that they're getting calls for. So um, they're a little bit more diverse, I would say. But fire, fire, they're good because they can respond with such readiness. So any questions after we... in terms of the uh, state. state. So the standing order that's in there is a statewide standing order. So it's, it's county? It's county. We do have one um, for the city of Somerville, okay. like for, from our city doctor who's on, who sits on our board of health, but we don't need it because um, Dr. Wally, who's the prov providing physician who's on that standing order supersedes our doctor. We do have one, um, but you don't need it. So Charlie Baker is the one who actually did this. So our governor was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if for some reason Charlie Baker changes his mind, we here in Somerville have our own, <laughs> but we don't need it. We just got it because I'm psychotic and I get doctor's orders. 
and I would say that that was, I would say that individual just may not have had enough information, or I don't know why he would say that. Um, but could be a different time, different place, and I think we're we've seen I think across the country that we need to get innovative and creative with the ways that we're helping individuals and not more rigid. So I'll end it on that. <laughs> All right. Yes, absolutely. So. In addition to what I do here, um, I'm also a narrator um, of, uh, I actually just because of uh, Erica in Somerville Media Center. So on July 31st, um, here at Fox Pop, from six at 6.30, starts at 6.30, we are going to be showing a free showing of a short documentary that the city of Somerville partnered with Somerville Media Center to produce, wow, did you hear my Boston accent there, Senna? Um <laughs> And it is basically a brief 20-minute, roughly 20-minute documentary that I narrate. That's why I threw that in there. Um, about the impact of the opioid epidemic nationally in Massachusetts and then locally here in Somerville. So um, we highlight some stories. We highlight these, these trainings and kind of what the city's doing to try to combat you know, these, this epidemic. So come out, share it, let people know. I've, I'll send you guys the flyer too when I send out this. Um, but it's 6.30 on July 31st here. So welcome to anyone to come. What's the limit here? How, how much can we fit? 80? So bring 80 of your bestest friends. <laughs> uh, I thought about that because I was like, what if people are batting down the doors? Like, let me in. That would be a good issue, that would be a good issue to have. Yeah, we'll send that out to folks, but it, it it'll be um it'll be a good one. I mean, I thought it was great. I'm kind of biased, but I I think Erica thinks it's great too, but she's probably biased too. <laughs> but And then we will have another one of these also here at Vox Pop. We're really taking full advantage of this place um, on August 6th. Um, 8th, yeah. August 6th is National Night Out, by the way. If anybody wants to come to that, it's at Foss Park. Uh, these are all the things I do. Um, so, yes, August 6th is National Night Out. We have, uh, it's in collaboration with the Somerville Police Department at Foss Park where we have performances and tabling and resources for folks, kids to come out um, and you can get some resources, see some performances and have a good time. Uh, and then August 8th is when we are doing the next version of this training uh, is going to be Thursday 6 to 7. Um, so if you have anybody else who wanted to come to this or if you think anybody would be interested, forward it out there. I can also send that flyer out to people again and uh, we hope to see more people. Thank you.